Pardon the interruption, I'm Chris Garrett. Sam, July 21st is National Junk Food Day. Do you have a dream junk food? It's right here, Chris. I call it the Frugier Twinix. It's a Twix bar wrapped in a Twinkie, topped with beef jerky, wrapped in an orange cherry fruit roll up. That's disgusting. Not bad. <laughs> summer CWC the better. I think that's great. Right. Uh, so welcome to CWC at 30. Uh, we're your hosts, Chris Garretts and Sam Mulberry. This is prime time at the library, but maybe feels a little bit more like late night at the library. Um, I think a mashup of tonight's show, Jimmy Fallon at the end, and that'll be kind of Dick Cabot up here, I guess. Now, Sam, this is CWC at 30. I think you've been part of the chorus as long as anyone. How's it doing these days? Uh, you know, I first met CWC when it was 10. So I you know, got to live with it through its kind of awkward middle school years. Um, I've been with it through its 20s, which has mostly been pretty good, although in the fall of 14, we had to bring Mike Holmes back to teach, which is kind of the equivalent of moving back into mom and dad's basement. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, I think moving for CWC at 40, do you think? Uh, just a lot more sort of midlife crisis jokes. I think we have about 20 minutes ready to go for that, so come back in 10 years. Yeah, and that's as close to a monologue as you're going to get here. Let's go straight into our program. We have a great show for you here this morning. We're going to dive into the history of this course that's been, I think, pretty foundational for a lot of people at Bethel. Um, and why don't we start by bringing up one of the founding fathers of CWC. We actually might have a second joining us if he can beat the Arden Hills traffic rush from his house. So Dan Taylor is not here, but Mike Holmes is here. Wait, is he here? Is Dan Taylor here? Okay, Mike Holmes, can you come on up? Let's give a round of applause. So I think the story, Mike, has entered into Bethel legend. Thanks for joining us, by the way. It's great to have you. I appreciate your work. Um, really it. I, um, I think the story is legend. That about 30 years ago, a frosty J term, four of our most distinguished faculty gathered near the music department to, to dream up a new multidisciplinary course that was kind of a Western Civ outline that had theology and church history and literature and philosophy. Um, Maybe you could just tell us a little bit about why was there a need for this course, and then how did you get roped into doing it? First of all, you missed the key qualification. You had to have facial hair to do that. That's changed over time. Yeah, it is. Go ahead. The, there we go. Uh, we had a new curriculum. And under the new curriculum, this was going to be one of the key courses. And whoever developed the curriculum had a vague idea of what it might be, and they stuck the four of us in a room that in to figure out what the world was actually going to do. So it was entirely curriculum-driven. How could it be a little more innovative, make us something that fit Bethel, and not just a generic Western Civ? And we went with it. And so a lot of Western Civ in there, but giving our drawing on literature, historian, Bible theology, and Try and do something different. Sure, you paint, especially you know, clear memories of the planning, you know, big debate that happened this year, the key moment where you made a decision that ended up looking really important. A lot of that's lost in the fog of a cold January. I think the big thing, though, was when he decided to frame it as Christianity and the Western culture. For us, that was kind of the key moment, the key breakthrough that made the rest of, of the month. Once we had that, Christianity and there was our dynamic we could then work with. All right, what was there before Christianity? We've got the greco background. Then this thing comes on the scene. What goes from there? And at the first time, it's it's not <coughs> a greco culture. It's an irritant in greco culture. And then eventually, Roman Empire falls, and you've got, it, it really gave us a breakthrough of framing the whole thing that I think is, to come back in 14, it was just astounding how much, how familiar it felt, having been out of it for a few years, how familiar felt coming back? Because that same basic dynamic was there, looking at the interaction. 
So did you teach it right away, or did you come back to it after pilot? Uh, we planned it in, in an urban pilot tested it that spring, <laughs> and I did it 85 through about 88, and then took off for sabbatical and came back for about another four-year stretch, and then off and on since then. So for that first year, so I was pretty heavily involved in it, yeah. So, I mean, one of the distinctives for faculty, of course, is you teach outside your fields pretty quickly. So you're, you know, obviously you have early church lectures, but do you have a favorite lecture going beyond your field of expertise? Outside our field, that's, for me, is never the case. I majored in history and as an undergrad in 19th and 20th century Europe and America. So this was kind of coming back to old territory. Uh, in the early years, one of my favorites was the Industrial Revolution one. And in more recent ones, the age of exploration and expansion have been some of my favorites. Uh, though I confess the Lutheran one's always fun, especially when I get to do Tietzel's little song and dance on his uh, advertising slogan for selling indulgences and so on. Making the students to make an indulgence. I know your father beat you, but help him out of purgatory anyway, you know. So, this is the box we used to have. Right? This was the box. As soon as the coin in the coin box rings, the soul from purgatory upward springs. You know. <laughs> when you're right in the face of some freshman male right there, he's pretty nervous. <laughs> Especially when I've hiked. This was another one of my habits. I would always climb to the top of each aisle in 313 twice during the lecture. And the first time you head up, the guy sleeping in the top back corner just freak out. Because <laughs> they don't realize you're coming all the way up. And when they finally do, it's desperation. Wake up, wake up! You know. So I made a point of doing that, though. And in the old 313, there was a resonance spot on the top of the right hand, second step down, where if you stood there, you got a real resonance. I'd always save that for a key point or whatever. <laughs> that was the spot. Too bad they, re they lost it in the remodel. So Mike, we mentioned that you came back to the course not long ago and taught a couple of times. Um, you were struck how similar it was. I mean, what, what, what was kind of essential to the course that had endured that you were maybe pleasantly surprised to see? That basic underlying dynamic of the relationship between Christianity and Western culture. Of course, the change, we chopped a little bit off the, the back end when we had the modern age course take over more. So a couple things we used to do weren't there. We didn't come quite as far. But that same basic refusing to equate the two, but rather trying to step back and critically look, how is Christianity related to at times becoming so enmeshed that it failed? It, it was that underlying dynamic that had been developed in different ways by the different faculty, but that was still there that really gave that sense of of coming home again in the sense of, yeah, this is this works. So I think one thing that changed is we had added a kind of athletic competition to the course called the Seed of Music Cup. I should explain what this is right now. Actually, Sam should probably explain what this is. So um, for a while, we would do these uh, competitions as review games, and uh, whoever, whichever professor's small groups won the most points would win the cup and get to hold this. So I'm very proud to say this is my office, usually. <laughs> but Mike, you, you arranged the rare feat of coming back and you won it just your one semester back. Yeah, on. the one time I came back when they had the cup, let's just say my team cleared the deck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you've accomplished a few things in your career, a Greek New Testament, uh, university professorship. Where does this rank? <laughs> <laughs> that semester, it might have been a top of the others right there. Yeah, that's the right answer. Thanks, Mike Holmes, for joining us. Uh, what well, you've seen, the four professors, uh, I don't know if Dan has not came yet, but Dan Taylor was part of it from English literature, and the two historians, uh, we have one of them here with us today, Kevin Craig, Kevin Craig, um, where are you wound up? So Kevin Craig was one of the founding fathers of the course and taught it for probably like 27 years. Some, I mean, for most of the, the life of the course until you, until you retired. And then also Professor Neil Ledega, who was our European historian before I showed up in 2003. Now, uh, Neil in Virginia, who also was a big part of the course, uh, could not be with us. As you might know, they're several hundreds of miles away. But they did record a video because they wanted to share some comments on this momentous occasion. Oh, Hello, I am Neil Ledega. And I'm Virginia Ledega. And we taught CWC for the first 15 years of its existence. Oh, I think you taught CWC for the first 15 years, but I started about three years after it had begun when G.W. Carlson made a big pitch to the deans 
that they would like to have a woman on at least one of the CWC teams. And he went back to the dean and said, um, he'll teach a course for free as long as they'd be willing to add me to one of the teams. And so the dean did. <laughs> what, what I remember best about CWC, I think, are the devotions. I've got vivid memories of devotion time from the very first devotion that I remember is Dan Taylor doing the first intro lecture on the first day of class and the first day of CWC, reading Hebrews 11 and talking about memory and how we remember well and how we read Hebrews 11 obediently by remembering and by taking CWC. And I stole that devotion from him when he left the team and did it, I think, every year that I taught CWC. And when I think about CWC, I remember one of the few moments when I taught on Neil's team. We never were on the same team as one another, but there was a moment in which he was sick or he suddenly lost his voice or he was suddenly stuck in traffic, and I got roped into doing his lecture. And he was a lecture I think I had done on my team, but I never used his notes. I found out late, I raced into 313, I opened the notes, I started going through it, it all made sense, the um, transparencies worked in that pre-PowerPoint day, until suddenly I was reading along and he had neatly typed into his notes that Luther thought this was all a batch of sheep dip. And because it was typed there, I read it. <laughs> because I realized what it was just as I was saying it. I paused the nanosecond, which meant all the students really found it easy to imagine what I wasn't saying. And the entire classroom broke into a gasp, and then into titters of laughter, and then into major laughter. And this was in, in the fall, and by that January, there was a broomball team in, um, in, in, at Bethel that was called the Sheep Dips. <laughs> His fault. It wasn't my fault. So I was the agent of this. What I really worked with were the TAs. And weren't they a great set of people over those years? And your last thoughts? Again, it's a devotion. I remember the devotion by John the Reisbruck that, um, that I did for the, the medieval lecture, one of the medieval lectures, um, in which the Reisbruck enjoins us all to praise God while we are here on earth, because those who do not praise God while here on earth will in eternity be silent. We miss hearing the faculty do these uh, devotions. They were great. Actually, we miss hearing the faculty. I learned so so much from my mm -hmm. colleagues. Um, I learned so much from hearing how my students heard what they were teaching, too. Uh, it was a great thing to do. We're so delighted that somehow CWC is 30 years old and people are still enjoying this or hating this. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much. God bless you all. We really do appreciate Neil and Virginia taking the time to do that. I have to say, one of the things I really do enjoy about the course is the kind of archaeology of it. And I'm one of the people who does the Hebrew 11, uh, Hebrew 12 devotion. I, I had no idea this originated with Dan Taylor way back when they had gone through the, uh, one of the others. Um, uh, Neil and Virginia, you probably know where we're kind of the directors of the course for a long time. Sam and I inherited that about 10 years ago. And so there has been occasional jokes about we're the new married couple at CWC. Um, <laughs> Sam, uh, 30th anniversary is what exactly? It's the pearl anniversary. Just in case you want to know. <laughs> I'm yeah. expecting pearls for it. I'm not sure what the modern equivalent is, probably Bitcoin or something. <laughs> Whatever you want to do, just so you know. Um, uh, one of the themes of the course is that this gets handed off then from generation to generation. So we brought up a couple of members of what was, in essence, Generation 2 or Generation 1B, I think, of the CWC faculty. Let's welcome Dan Ritchie and Paul Reisner. So uh, Dan, I think there's an obvious question to start with here, which is, what was Sam like as a CWC student? You were a small group leader. Can you tell us what Sam Mulberry from Muscle at the time was like as a CWC student? I understand he maybe got one question wrong this whole semester. Can you verify or falsify that? Uh, I can verify that. I'm surprised he got any any uh, any any wrong at all. But uh, we did have. Um, I mean, you could tell the students who got it, and the ones who were just. Uh, getting by. 
and it, it was a great place. You talked about the TAs and uh, the, the top students, obviously, but it's not just, it wasn't just academic achievement, it was, it was the students that really understood the, the Christians and culture issues of CWC, and Sam, of course, was, was one of those. And we'll talk more about the TAs as we go along here today. By the way, these are um, some uh, artifacts from the course, as it were. These are t-shirts and sweatshirts the TAs have worn. Now, um, viewers, I understand there's a raffle for one of these. Yeah, so if, uh, if you haven't signed up in the back, there's a, a place to sign up. We're going to have a drawing for not a used t-shirt like up there. I have one that's new. So. <laughs> okay, so Dan, I think we actually do need to explain um, this picture. You're in the red regalia here with the awesome sunglasses. Can you explain to us what's happening in this picture? This is the original Augustan wrap. Uh, this was, I think, actually in the 80s uh, when this was taken. Um, but uh, you all remember Glenn Wiebe, those of you who are older, the ITS uh, computer science person, his son David thought uh, CWC was a little bit too boring. It needed to be jazzed up a bit. And so he and I think a, a female student uh, worked on a, a rap uh, for the life of St. Augustine. Uh, now, I was on a team with Greg Boyd, who is extremely musical and rhythmical, and, and Kevin. Uh, so there was, a, uh, and Greg, uh, Greg loved and admired and respected Kevin as we all do, but uh, he was a little bit amused at times at the rhythmic deficiencies of some of us on the team. And so the Augustan rap was perfect for putting all of us out front and displaying our talents uh, such as they were. Uh, we are here to talk to you today, but we have some things we want to say. Uh, St. Augustine, he was born in the year 354. His, his mama was a Christian, but his daddy swore, and it went on from there. Uh, so that's not surprising around Augustine. So, uh, long before Lynn Manuel Miranda was having Jefferson and Hamilton do rap battles. Yes, we were using I am so for grateful for Hamilton. I can't yeah, I wait for it. Uh, so, Paul, you are, I think, maybe the first Bethel alum who taught on CWC faculty. I was trying to think if there would have been a predecessor, but you had not taken CWC, I assume, during your time at Bethel. Um, no, because I taught it the second semester was offered. Okay, so you came very early to it. Um, I mean, what was different about, I don't know what you're, if you have any memory of what Western Civ was like here at Bethel or what the curriculum was like. And, I mean, how successful was this change that the, the four founders and then you all had? Wait, now you're asking me to go back a long ways. I have a historian. I don't remember any Western Civ course when I was a uh, freshman at Bethel. <clears throat> I remember um, freshman colloquy, uh, which was kind of, and later became intro liberal arts, and then writing and research. I talked some of those later, but um, they they tended to be thematic or or reading certain books that were maybe interesting or on hot social topics at the time, um, and had writing and some research involved with them, but, and we had interesting people come in. We used to read Potok um, a lot and other things like that. So nothing, I, I don't remember any, I'm sorry about your history department and your degree, but I don't remember any history at all. <laughs> well, that's, that's why I thought philosophy and literature then. I mean, oh, good, yes. Uh, uh, so what was, what was it like integrating philosophy or literature into this? I mean, a Western Civ course, but intentionally multidisciplinary from the first point. Like, well, was there a particular moment you especially liked to raise a question to students, or a reading you liked to teach, or a, a chapter in the history of philosophy you to introduce students to? Um, I used to give the, the Plato, initial Plato lecture, and just as an aside, one of the, um, at least on my team, Dan and I were on opposite team because I was taught with Roger Olson for years and years and years. I want to say something about him in a minute, but well, I could say many things about him. Um, but uh, I was a little, uh, my aside is I was a little shocked even relatively recently when somebody new came over from CWC to Western Humanities, which Dan and I work with now, and they were doing the uh, Plato lecture or some version of it or something, and I was just sitting back in the lecture, and all of a sudden I'm thinking, oh, I, you know, I, 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 I said that, I said that. I mean, the notes were just like straight from my lecture from 30-some years ago, whatever it was. And which is fine, I mean, we all swapped things all the time, but I was surprised. Maybe I would work harder on 
carefully calibrating them or something, if I knew they were going to have that longevity, you know, that kind of thing. But uh, just to say something about Plato and a philosophical question, one thing that always struck me and seemed to connect with students was, um, it's one thing to talk about the history of philosophy and so on, but I, I tend to see philosophy as trying to make sense of the world now. So it doesn't matter if someone said it a long time ago or now or whenever, we still have the same questions. And so I used to spend a little time at least uh, looking at the, the issue of, uh, I guess we call it objectivity of ethics, something like that. Because I think that's one place where uh, Plato has some very clear things to say in opposition to other philosophers at the time. And it's a, it's a very current uh, question for us today. And as Christians, we think about these things. Um, Dan, Paul alluded to the fact you both teach on Western humanities now. How much do you think you know, the four founders of CWC could visit a humanities session in a small group? Would they recognize the elements of the original CWC and humanities? Is there much continuity across that? Yeah, uh, the main continuity is uh, the treatment of the Christ and culture issues. Um, we took that over pretty much uh, directly from the CWC, including the, the descriptions that I think uh, Virginia came up with. Uh, so that, it, the, uh, the teaching of how Christians interact with culture, I think, is so fundamental to the incoming Bethel student uh, that you're going to find that in both classes. The difference is that humanities really flips the, uh, the class structure of CWC. So we have just one lecture a week and two quite long discussion periods. And so there's, uh, we deal more with full texts. And, um, have students write papers uh, as opposed to uh, the, the format CWC. Right. Well, thank you too for standing in for it. We have many faculty in here, but yeah, if you want to. I really do want to add this. Um, I was upset after a number of years that uh, I noticed that, you know, we spent a lot of time on early church and things like that, which I thought was great. But um, in the sequence of lectures, there were no lectures about actually the time of Christ and, uh, you know, the, origin, the origins of Christianity, you might say. And I remember I had long arguments with Roger Olson about that, saying, I know you want to do all these debates and things that happen right afterwards, but a lot of our students really don't seem to know very much about the gospel, you know, straight up. And so I finally convinced him to give a lecture on Jesus, which I thought was kind of important. <laughs> So Paul mentioned that one of the, uh, I think, probably a featured lecture every semester is the one on Plato and Aristotle. It's been given by many of our philosophers through the years. One especially famous version of it was given by David Williams, who was a Bethel alum, came back and taught here for a long time. David was also kind enough to record a greeting to us from the mountains of California. Hi, CWC people. My name is David Williams. I taught at Bethel from uh, 1998 to 2006, and I'm now a professor of philosophy at Azusa Pacific University, and I'm the executive director of the High Sierra program. I thought about, rather than sending in a video, uh, it would be more appropriate since I taught CWC so long ago. It was so long ago that we used transparencies. So I thought maybe I should just send in a set of transparencies and someone could fire up an overhead. And then, as seemed to be the rule, and I followed this rule, you couldn't reveal the entire transparency. You had to take a piece of paper and slowly slide it down. And, it down. and I remember thinking, it's like a strip tease. Like I'm just taking off just a little bit at a time, and I don't know if it was, you know, we had to keep it CW sexy. Or I followed the rules. Uh, but no one even used PowerPoint then. That's how long it's been since I've been at Bethel. Um, like most newly minted PhDs, I was just a complete punk. And I remember rolling in there thinking, I'm going to show these benighted oldsters how knowledge really works. And I just remember having the belief that everyone was just a wannabe philosopher and that they just couldn't be. And they were just struggling to try to do that, but um, I would lead the way. And I remember for the first time realizing, wow, there really is a difference between disciplines. Uh, I remember Thomas Bechdel just raging about how literature was not adornment, and I thought, isn't that what it is? I could see that his passion to distinguish his discipline as not just something that people could treat um, 
philosophers, namely, could treat as, well, we'll just clear up the literary stuff and get to the philosophical bits. That was eye-opening for me. The mentoring that I got in teaching a team talk course like that was incredibly annoying on some level. I don't know why we had to have so many meetings to produce. We would have these meetings to produce an exam, and then we would produce the same exam that we made for last semester, but it took hours of meetings to do it. Um, and I kind of chafed under that. But now I realize, I realize how much it takes to actually make something happen with people from different disciplines and across disciplinary lines and across different fields and that those meetings were necessary. And it was fantastic mentoring. I mean, I love CWC lectures. I love giving them because the faculty were in the room and it was pressure. So you're a new faculty member and all these kids are in there and just the energy of that big room and knowing that uh, all the faculty are there and knowing that you're going to meet after the uh, the lecture and they're going to critique it and there wasn't you know there weren't a lot of punches pulled i remember mike holmes telling me one time about a lecture on the scientific revolution that i mean his only comment one typical holmesian fashion was that lecture occurred in a vacuum and he was right. I got great mentoring um, from my colleagues in the philosophy department, but it was like I had a whole other department and something that really sparked in me a love of moving outside of my own field and into other disciplines. And so I can't thank CWC enough for that. And it really sparked in me a love of interdisciplinary teaching, which is why I'm here. Um, and so I just want to exhort uh, my colleagues that are involved in the interdisciplinary thing. I think it is one of the great things that Christian colleagues do. We still have the resources. We have a lot of disagreements and we have um, to work hard to find common ground, but we do have that common ground in Christ. And I feel like it's one of the great resources that um, Christian colleges, that the, 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 the academy um, from, uh, from, the, from the Christian point of view has to offer the, the academic world at large, and it's kind of sad to see that as institutions chase secular success, that interdisciplinarity um, goes by the wayside because it's hard and it takes a lot of work and it takes a lot of commitment to deal with colleagues from across other lines. So I'm truly grateful to CWC. I hope you uh, keep rolling. Maybe you can check in with me for the 60th birthday, because I'll be 80 then. Um, but I will maybe make up the transparency and send it in. Blessings on all of you, and, um, and may God bless all your work. Of course, it means that David is 50, which is kind of hard to believe. Um, we've got another philosopher up here, Sarah Shady, and another example of the interdisciplinarity, Amy Poppinga from the History Department, two representatives of the current teaching team. Actually, this is, we've tried to hear from a few professors. There are a lot of other professors here. If you have fought it, if you are currently teaching, could you please stand up? Or if you're in the humanities program, which I think we're also trying to fold into this, we'd like to just acknowledge you for the way you've done I appreciate most about CWC. As David said, it becomes almost like your second department. And in my case, it's where a lot of my best friends live. And at the end of, say, fall semester, you're a little bit um, goofy. And you decide to take a Christmas card photo together uh, outside the admissions. <laughs> and so it's, it's nice to end with, with a couple of our closest friends. Uh, Sarah and Amy, you're, I guess, from the newest iteration of this generational shift. Can you talk about what it's like to come into a course that, in your case, have been around for 20 plus years to the point you joined? Was, was it easy to come on, hard to come on? What was that transition like for you? Um, well, I'm really glad that they changed the requirement of facial hair so that we, you know, <laughs> that's much appreciated. Uh, you know, it was a challenge my first year to feel like well, I was trained as a philosopher and now I'm becoming <laughs> a person who teaches church history and uh, theology and, and, and different things as well. But um, I was really, you know, um, agree with so much that David said, and David uh, was on the team that I was on my first year, and after my very first lecture, I thought I was gonna throw up before I gave it, and then, uh, you know, David came with this handwritten set of notes, um, you know, critiques, and then I felt like I was gonna cry, but <laughs> but really the, the um, learning how to be a teacher 
and being mentored directly by having other colleagues with you in the classroom every day is one of the best things that could have ever happened in my career. Um, yeah, to, to reiterate some of that, I think that team teaching, um, and I started teaching CWC as an, as an adjunct, and um, the experience of being able to team teach um, on some of the things that David Williams said to be able to get feedback, and for me it's always been um, relayed to me very positively and supportively, but um, I just have so appreciated that, and um, this idea of the way that we do meetings together, we do often meet, and sometimes the first question is, do we really need to meet? But those are actually our best meetings because they turn into conversations about greater issues on our campus, um, in higher ed in general, um, the issue of Christ and culture, and so um, I like meetings. So, um, you know, I really enjoy that aspect of it, but um, I think, too, it's been, it's been fun to be a part of seeing some changes um, in the way that we construct the curriculum in the course and the way that it gets delivered, the way that I think we've become increasingly sensitive to the greater diversity here at Bethel, and I think that we've been very intentional about trying to um, recognize that Western civilization doesn't develop in a vacuum, and so to make sure to bring in other voices and to acknowledge that and to also recognize that our students come from multiple backgrounds, especially different, um, different um, Christian traditions, and I've enjoyed seeing us sort of um, find ways to really connect with students who I think maybe have felt like they couldn't find their own, um, they couldn't find themselves in our story, and I think we've done better with that. So it just happens, at least in the scene, that you two are the last people to give a lecture is in our current semester at CWC. So can you just share, like, what was something important that happened in class this past week? Is, as you talk about the Catholic Reformation, or Sarah, as you talked about the Anabaptist, the Radical Reformation, what was something you hope that students got out of those, those class sessions? Well, I, I think that um, for me, so Catholic Reformation was on Monday. Um, this, I don't want this to sound bad, but I, it, I think it's helpful in our current climate for students to recognize the, the divisions that have resulted in violence between Christian groups. Um, and that awareness of our own history, I think, um, helps them better um, at least explore or not understand, but at least problematizes for them the religious division and the religious violence that they see today. Um, and so the better they are aware of the divisions that have existed within our own um, tradition, uh, they recognize that we need to, um, that our, one, we need to, to think about who we extend compassion to and what that looks like, um, but the fact that it also needs to be done from a place of always asking our own community the same questions that we ask of other people's religious communities. Yeah, I think that uh, one of the really important things about the course, and I imagine this is true in humanities as well, is yes, we're teaching a whole lot of content uh, to establish an academic foundation for the rest of the Bethel education, but I think we're also teaching a lot of soft skills, uh, social skills, the role of empathy when dealing with difference, um, study skills, certainly. But I had the opportunity to teach on the Anabaptists on Friday, and that's a fun one for me because I grew up Mennonite, and so I get to tell silly stories from my, my own childhood and kind of put a face on the whole um, on the whole lecture. But but really, my subtext there is I want them to realize that just because someone seems really different on the outside, it's always important to understand how do they get to that conclusion? Why does this belief make sense? Um, and to really have empathy for the fact. I started that lecture with uh, an image that's probably been used in CWC for 30 years. <laughs> it's a tree, and the trunk, you know, has the original early church, and then that divides into the Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church, and then after the Reformation, you have all of these branches go off, and to say, we're still all one family. This is the body of Christ. It's not just your branch of the tree that you grew up with, but your branch is part of this larger story, and I think that's one of the core lessons that we try to teach them throughout the semester. Thanks, Sarah, for representing the <laughs> So we don't have a lot of time to talk about it, but I do want to draw your attention to uh, something that will continue out from the celebration, is that Sam has been working closely with Kent Gerber, our digital library manager, Kent's up right here, to build a digital collection of 
uh, different kinds of artifacts from the 30 years of the course added to what's already a really stellar digital library. It's, you know, as a Methodist historian, it's really great to be able to think about researching the history of this institution through a class that's actually been around for generations, not just students, but faculty. And so I really encourage you to look at that. Sam's been sharing little pieces of it through his Thursday devotions that he shared via the C faculty. I think one really exciting part of it is that Sam invested some time in collecting oral histories and some of the many teaching assistants who are part of the class. And so if you go to the digital library and you go to the CWC Authority Collection, you'll find a tab at the top that says something like TA Oral History. And so um, I think you just want Facebook or email, you just invite them to report little memories of the course. And it really spans much of the, the history of the course. Yeah, it's, about, it's about 25 years of the CWC TA. So speaking of this case, um, I, I want to mention them as well, because I think, you know, to me, that's been a really distinctive, uh, valuable part of the course, to get these students who come back, and in some cases never leave, uh, to teach the course. I know we have some current and former TAs here as well. Can you all stand up and be right here? Some of you are on the faculty team. Um, one of the other things I think is nice about the digital library is that it, it means that uh, some some colleagues who can't be with here, can be with us for other reasons, are still here. Um, a lot of the media that's on the course already uh, comes from CWC The Radio Show, which is a podcast we did for several years that really started with uh, Stacey Hunter Hack at the summer meeting, said, hey, you should do CWC The Radio Show, and then was on this podcast for three years. And so um, that's there. She's been part of other things. Uh, and, and so in a way, Stacey's memory has to live on through this uh, digital collection. I, I just wanted to pause and acknowledge that amongst the other loss we've suffered, you know, we as a CWC family have been touched by, by Stacy's death. Um, and I'll just claim the privilege of sharing a memory of an example of how this mentoring process has worked. Because I, I came in, and I think the best piece, piece of teaching advice I ever got was from Stacy. And I don't think it was tied to a specific lecture, but it was just afterwards. Uh, she said, you know, what teaching is, is, is learning how to magnify your personality. And especially in a big room like 313, you've got to fill it up. And often the students don't necessarily bring a lot of energy, and you've got to supply it. And you've got to learn to be the bigger version of yourself. And that's going to look different for each of us. But that, that always struck me as uh, just a profoundly true insight that you shared. And it's really, I think, affected my teaching in a lot of ways. And so we just wanted to take a moment to pay tribute to you, to Stacey, and the many ways in which she took the course as well. Um, before we move on to our last item, Sam, you want to go Absolutely. So we have our CWC TA t shirt here. Lots of names. The winner is Diana Banks. Uh, so the other piece of teaching advice that Stacy gave me in my first semester is, uh, she said, you know, you, I know you feel like you're an introvert or something, but you've got it right, you're, you're actually a ham at heart. <laughs> and most of us who get up and do something in CC313 are hams, but some of us are especially hammy, and we even let ourselves be talked into doing uh, creative versions of teaching. Um, or we talk to everyone else into letting us do, say, musical numbers, which has been a feature of the course. And so I thought maybe we should end with a musical number of some sort. And hey, there's a guitar back here. I'm not here. Now, <clears throat> there, there are a couple of things we could do, but because Dan Ritchie was kind enough to mention uh, the CWC version of the Augustine rap, I thought that perhaps there should be a live version of the Augustine rap. So this had gone away for a long time, and then 10 years ago, uh, for, I was sitting in class, paying attention to a lecture, but also mentally drafting new lyrics to the Augustine rap. And then Sam and I, over that summer, when I got married, I came back and filmed a video of this. Now, I would rather put this live with puppets. I'd rather put this live than show the video, which tells you how embarrassing the video is. You can find it if you, if you want to. Um, so I will try to do this. Um, why is there any part here, you might ask? Because otherwise I'd be tempted to bust it see that. <laughs> now, I will do this if you all agree to take part in this production. This does have a kind of sing-along component. So the chorus is going to something like this. We'll try it. Oh, Augustine! 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 That's it. It's a music <laughs> that part. It's incredibly catchy. You'll hear your word in your head the rest of the day. It's going to be great. And then I'll do the embarrassing part. <laughs> With apologies to MCs everywhere. <laughs> <laughs>
The Augustina Hippo dropped in 3 or 54. Constantine had was 30 years before. I grew up hating on the prayer. See, his mama was a Christian, but his daddy was a pagan. On the mistress of the gas station, it are on the chair. They call him Del Monte, cause he got it out the pair. Play, I had his way with all the ladies. Until the girl said, Boo, chill, we're gonna have a baby. Oh, Augustine, Augustine, Augustine. Augustine. Getting busted, he busted. Augustine. But he's trusting, he's trusting. God made his walk itself, and our hearts will pray the rest in him. Carthage, the time the Romans flattened, and Hava, he's a scholar, philosophy, and Latin. Told him all the Cicero's the illest. Some man who keeps holding son, you don't know what ill is, what's going down the battle. Good and evil war, the spiritual is admirable, the physical is abhorrent. I could give them answers that were hidden. But when they said to give up sex, he said, oh no, you didn't. Oh, God, oh, God, yes, oh, yes. Augustine. Yeah, he's lusting, he's lusting. Augustine. But he's trusting, he's trusting. I made as far as that, and I will pay the rest in him. Took a job with Italy, I read up on the platelets. Learned the evil, just the lack of good, and only good, excessive man and landing man who tried to reach him. He said, I don't believe your words, but broke the bomb at preaching. He read the Holy Scripture, and the picture started shifting. He prayed to God to save him from himself, but he kept shifting. Until he fell down weeping on his knees. He heard the voice of children saying, take up, and take up, and take up, and read. Oh, Augustine. Augustine. And he's lusting, he's lusting. Augustine. But he's trusting, he's trusting. Take up, and take up, and take up, and read. Oh, Augustine. Augustine, Augustine, God made this for himself and our hearts will find you rest in A ridiculous amount of cake over there. Please get two pieces. First, we need to thank a few people who are part of this. Um, the one name that's not up there is most important name, which is Sam Mulberry. Not only has taught this yeah. course for like 30, in credits for 30 semesters, but has really thrown himself into this presentation, the digital collection. It's a big part, I think, of the institutional memory of this program and of this institution. So let's please acknowledge it.